want to invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, encourage you to take notes as we make our way along this message and every message, uh, just so uh, you know, on Monday afternoon, Tuesday, all of the notes that I preach from here, just a manuscript of my message, goes online on the media portion of our website. If you ever miss anything, I know I move fast. And so if you ever miss anything, you can download all of my notes right there and just really encourage you to go back, listen in throughout the week, uh, look at your notes, pray through what God's teaching you, and uh, it'll make the sermon come alive more as you engage with us. Really encourage you to do that. Acts chapter 17, the title of the message today, you can write this down if you are taking notes, it's called Eager to Speak. That's what we see here in Acts chapter 17. As Paul makes his way to Athens by himself, we're going to look at de- in detail at his Actions as he entered this city, and it's going to be very apparent. Uh, you'll see it that he is ready to talk to people about Jesus. He is ready to go to the synagogues and talk to the Jewish people about Jesus, He's eager to speak to them. He goes to the marketplace so that he can talk to the common, everyday Athenian, and he talks to them about Jesus, eager to speak to them. And then he makes his way to Mars Hill, where we are in this message today, to speak to the best and brightest philosophers, and he is eager to speak to them, always eager to speak about Jesus. Now, I love this chapter because as a preacher of the gospel, I feel like I can identify with Paul a little bit in being eager, excited, amped up uh, to preach. Now, I feel like I'm amped up to preach nearly every Sunday, all right? I feel energy, I feel ready to go, uh, but there's sometimes, just because of the situation uh, that is at hand, the group of people that you're talking to, the circumstance that you find yourself as a preacher, that you just get a little extra amped up, a little extra excited about it. I was thinking about that this week, just kind of the most excited I've ever been uh, to preach. I thought of three times, okay? The first time was the first time that I ever preached. I was 17 years old. Uh, I knew that God was working in my heart, a call to ministry, and I just feel impressed. If you're a teenager, a young teenager in the room, junior high, high school, Uh, Even elementary school, man, I pray that God uh, would work in your heart in such a way that if you ever feel a desire uh, to go into ministry, that you'd let us know so that we can walk with you through that process. And I just remember as a senior going to my student pastor and saying, I sense the Lord's calling me into ministry. I want to be a leader in our church. I want to be a leader at school as it relates to just being uh, someone who's on fire for Jesus. And he did something that was really wise. I say really wise. It might have been really foolish looking back at it. But he said, listen, we've got a fifth quarter coming up this Friday night. A fifth quarter, I played football, so four quarters of a football game. And then the fifth quarter, we would usually go to the church, and uh, it would be a safe place for kids to hang out. There'd be a band there and a speaker and games that you're playing, food to eat. Well, this Friday, that Friday night fifth quarter was going to be in our school gymnasium. And so all my friends were going to be there. He said, why don't you preach the message? And so as a 17-year-old, I said, let's do this. And for the first time, I started studying God's Word. I'd always studied God's Word, but for the first time, I had studying God's Word to teach it to someone else. And I'm telling you, that week, uh, God turned my heart. I knew this is what I had to do the rest of my life. And I was more excited about preaching that message than I was playing in the Friday night football game. I couldn't wait to get there, tell my friends about Jesus. I was up in my study upstairs uh, a month or so ago, and I was going through some old boxes, and I found that, that sermon that I preached, the very first sermon, and it was horrible. I read it, I was so embarrassed, but I was so amped up. The second time that I've just been eager to speak was the very first time that I got to preach in big church at uh, the former church that I served back in Dallas. I can remember it, I was the young singles pastor, college pastor there for about nine years, and I get the call one day, Jarrett, you're, you're preaching big church. I was 29 years old, and uh, this was a big deal for me. And so I immediately was like, all right. And so I, get, I start getting fired up. Now, it was going to be on a, a holiday weekend, so nobody is going to be there. It's a safe time for Jarrett to preach. But nonetheless, I was fired up. I was amped up. And I, I go, and that week, I just start getting so nervous. I mean, this is my first time to preach. I can't blow this. God, God's called me to be a preacher, and it can't be bad. And so I, I start getting nervous, and my prayer starts to change that week. And I kid you not, this is a true story. I prayed more that week for Jesus to come back and and return (laughs) to deliver me from preaching that message. (laughs) Then I I prayed for the message. I'm like, God, get me out of this. I don't know that I can do it. But I preached and it was great. Third time, just amped up to preach, was when I came here to preach in view of a call. 
I mean, I couldn't sleep the night before. Now, for those of you that are uh, new to Baptist life or Baptist polity, here's how this works in a Baptist church. When a church doesn't have a pastor, they elect a, what they call a search committee to go out and find the new pastor. Let me just tell you, you got the greatest search committee that God ever put together, all right? They're unbelievable, incredible. And um, I, was, I was scheduling your preach. So for Baptist church, they, they find a preacher, they interview candidates, and they think, all right, you're our guy. But here's the deal. The church, because it's, bat- it's congregationally led, you have to vote on it. And according to our bylaws, uh, I had to get a 70%, all right? And I've told you before, I hadn't needed a 70% that bad since my college finals days, all right? And so I'm amped up, ready to go. I knew God had put a word in my heart, and I, mean, I couldn't sleep the night before, ready to get here and deliver God's word, and I'm so glad uh, that you voted me in, and uh, it's just been a great year uh, serving as your pastor. But I'm telling you, I was, I was eager to speak. It's that, it's that attitude, it's that eagerness, that excitement uh, that I think Paul was feeling when he went into this city in Athens. Now, to catch you up on where we are, if you've missed a week or two, I'm just gonna do a fast pace, catch you up where we are. Uh, if you look at the map, we're on Paul's second missionary journey. Now, the second missionary journey started right over here in Antioch. This was the sending church, and uh, Paul and Silas, or Silvanus as you see him in scripture, they decide to come up through uh, Cilicia right here, and they're gonna check on all the churches that they started on the first missionary journey. If you remember, Barnabas and John Mark, they come over here to Cyprus, but Paul and Silas, uh, they go this way, and they start checking on all these churches right here. They originally wanted to come up here into Bithynia, but the Spirit of God prevents them uh, from coming, and so they come right over here through Mycenae. They get to this port city called Troas right here, and this is where Paul receives a vision from Macedonia. Now, this is Macedonia right here, and this is modern-day Greece. And so uh, they, Paul receives this vision of a man that says, come over here and help us. We need you. And so Paul, he hightails it. Him and Timothy and Silas, they get over here. They land in Neapolis and they get to Philippi and they begin this, well, this interstate called the Ignatian Way. Went all the way through Macedonia here to the Aegean Sea. And they go by Amphipolis. They go by Apollonia. They get to Thessalonica. If you remember, they ran out of town in Thessalonica. We looked at this last week. They get down here to an off-the-road kind of place called Berea. The people from Thessalonica chase them down and run Paul out of Berea. And so the church sends Paul 200 miles south to the great city of Athens. And this is the first time that we know of since the conversion of Paul, where he spent three years in the Arabian desert that we know of, it's the first time that he's completely by himself right here in Athens. Now, just a couple of things about this world city, Athens. First of all, it was the oldest city in the world at the time of Paul getting there. It's the birthplace of philosophy, politics, art, literature. I mean, it influenced the entire world. The whole world at this time is speaking the Greek Language. When you hear names like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, all these great thinkers, all these great philosophers, they made their home or at one time lived. This was the birthplace right here in Athens. It was also an uber religious city. Uh, it was an outpost for pagan worship. Uh, Petronius, a Roman, a Roman historian, remarked that it was easier to find a god than it was to find a man in Athens. God's everywhere. Maybe you've been to the Far East and you've seen statues and temples and people bowing down to them and offering their sacrifices, pulling off on the side of the road to pay homage to them. This is what it was like in Athens. Uh, uh, Pausanias, a Greek geographer, you say, did you say that name right? I have no idea. I tried to Google pronounce it, uh, you know, to listen to it on YouTube and still don't know if I got it right. But Greek geographer and historian wrote that Athens had more images than all of Greece put together. I mean, you're talking, it was a hotbed for paganism. Xenophon, a Greek writer, disciple of Socrates, wrote that Athens was one great altar, one great offering to the gods. The name Athens, it came from the goddess Athena who had a huge temple built in her honor around 438 BC. Here's a pic of it today. You'll see it right here. It's pretty remarkable. This is today just the ruins 
Uh, this is called the Parthenon, and there was a huge statue to the goddess Athena in here. And uh, this is the ruin, still impressive today. This is what it might have looked like uh, at the time of Paul. So pretty remarkable, pretty big temple there. This is the city that Paul walks into. And again, for the first time in his ministry, he's alone by himself. So what's he going to do? He gets to this city that I believe he wanted to go to. What's he gonna do? Now, if I'm Paul, again, recount what he's been through. He's beaten with rods in Philippi and thrown in jail. Uh, he's chased out of Thessalonica, goes to Berea, chased out of Thessa, th- chased out of Berea. If I'm Paul, let me tell you what I'm doing when I get to Athens. I'm looking for the finest spa in Athens, all right? <laughs> Little R&R. There was a theater that set, seated 17,000 people. I'm going to go try to catch Hamilton or something, all right? I'm going to go see a show. Uh, there was a stadium where some Olympic games were played. Maybe I'd go see a you know, the sports that were being played. That's what I'd do. But that's not what Paul does. He's not on a sightseeing trip. He's on a mission. In fact, look at what the Bible says, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. The Bible says, now while Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy were gonna meet him. He's by himself at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. He gets to the city that he's heard about He begins walking up and down the streets. And the Bible says that he sees this idol worship. He sees these temples. He sees all these images everywhere. And his spirit is provoked within him. It means uh, he, he he was frustrated. It created angst. He was angered by it. And so Paul, he does what he always did in these situations. He goes to where the people are and he starts talking to them about Jesus. Again, he is eager to speak about Jesus. Look at verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogues. He said, I'm gonna go to the first place I know where the Jewish people are, have an appreciation for the promise of the Messiah, the Old Testament scriptures. He begins to reason with them about Jesus. Then the scripture says he goes to the marketplace and he went every day sharing Jesus with those that happen to be there. Now we said this last week and it bears repeating again. Paul had a supreme passion for the glory of Christ. Like he wanted the glory of Christ known wherever he went. And this is why he endured, this is why he persevered in tough times because he knew the glory of Christ was worth it. And so uh, any beating he took, any jail time he had, any town he got chased out of, he considered that cost worthy because Jesus was worthy. He also had a huge heart for people. And what he saw in these people bowing down to these gods, being led astray by the enemy, being blinded by their sin, it broke his heart. And so everywhere he went, synagogue, marketplace, wherever he went, He reasoned with people, conversed with people, talked with people about Jesus. It's a good place to just pause and ask the question this morning. When we see people around us looking at idols, worshiping idols, you know, they may not be statues. They may not be images. I remember when I was in India uh, in 2007, I took a group of young professionals to India And we did exactly what the Bible said. We we broke up into groups of two. And we went from house to house, from business to business, sharing Jesus. And I remember going to this uh, little storefront where this man was sitting there. I got a picture of him uh, right here. I don't remember his name, but I remember going in the storefront. And in his storefront right there, he had gods everywhere. This is in India. I mean, he had pictures of them. He had statues of them. Hundreds of gods. And we visited for about an hour, and I just asked, tell me about these gods. Who are they? What do they do? And he went one by one telling me for about an hour at the end of him telling me about these gods. I don't know where this came from because I'm not smart enough to ask this question. God gave it to me. I said, how's that working for you? (laughs) And he just looked back at me, and he said, not very well. And I told him about Jesus. He didn't pray to receive Christ that day, but seeds were planted And I just bring this up to say, you know, Paul saw all these people worship idols. His heart was broke within him. It provoked something in him, anger, angst, frustration. 
And it's just a question of application. When we see people worshiping idols, and again, it's not statues or temples, but anything that you depend on, rely on, lean on, trust in more than Jesus is an idol. So it might be the almighty dollar that you're bowing down to. That's what consumes your thought life. How much is in that bank account? That's an idol. It might be people pleasing. You don't want to say no to this person because you might disappoint them or they might think less of you. That person's an idol. It might be something else in your life that you're bowing down to. Like if you can't have tough conversations or you can't handle pressure without going to something else like the bottle or drugs or food or relationship or whatever it is, that stuff could become an idol. Just because we don't have temples and little statues, don't think for a moment that our world's not full of idolaters. I think it was Jonathan Edwards that said, our heart is an idol factory making machine, to paraphrase him. And so, are we provoked when we see people who are created in the image of God not worshiping the one true God? Does it create frustration, cause for concern? Or do we even think about it? Do we just go on our way? The Bible says Paul was provoked, agitated. These people are being led astray, blinded by the enemy. I have to think that when Paul wrote to the church in Rome about people exchanging the glory of God for images resembling people and crawling things, Romans chapter one, I'll just read a portion of it. Verse 18 through 23, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of the men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to him. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. In other words, we ought to be able to look up, see that there's a creator and it point us to, to the, that fact. Like, there's something bigger than me out here. Not something I can make with my hands and bow down to. For although they knew God, verse 21, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkening. And then look at this, verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Paul had to have Athens in mind when he wrote that to the church in Rome. And so here he is debating and reasoning and using logic And discussing the scriptures with people who proclaim to be wise. But in reality, they were fools and they were showing their foolishness. And bowing down to created things. There are two groups that are specifically mentioned here that Paul engages with. We read about them in verse 18. The Bible says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others says he seems to be preaching, uh, be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, Epicureans and Stoics, they represented the worldly philosophies of the day. And Paul, very different, the Bible says, verse 18, is preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's very different than what these people believed and embraced. Uh, the Epicureans, they believed that God was distant, that The gods didn't really um, intervene in the affairs of man. They had their own God stuff going on. And Paul's saying, oh, God's not distant. He's come near in the person of Jesus. He's preaching Jesus in the resurrection. The Epicureans, they didn't think that God cared about their personal lives. And here Paul's preaching Jesus, that God cares so much about your personal life that he left heaven, wrapped himself in flesh, and came to earth. He's preaching Jesus in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife. What's done is done. That's why it's kind of, you know, if it feels good, do it. Because once you're done, you're done. Once you're dead, you're done. And Paul comes preaching Jesus in the resurrection. No, there's life after death. You're going to give a judgment. You're going to give an account for your life. The Stoics, they... They believe that you could be one with the universe, one with nature. Just use logic and reasoning. Don't, you know, just, just put away emotions at all costs. But if you just use the right logic and the right reasoning, you can become one with the universe and nature, whatever that means. And Paul comes along and says, you can't be. The only person that was one with God was Jesus. And he's separate than his created universe. 
And Paul preaches this message. Jesus and the resurrection. And the response is, what's this babbler talking about? The response is, he's preaching about foreign deities of some kind. He's bringing other gods in this place. So look at what they say. Starting in verse, uh, into verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange teaching to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing, Luke says, except telling and hearing something new. So Paul's got an audience here. So they take him to the Areopagus. It's known as the Hill of Ares. Ares was the Greek god of war. He's known by his Roman name, Mars, hence Mars Hill. Here's a picture of Mars Hill. If you travel to Greece, uh, you will go uh, to Mars Hill on the Journeys of Paul trip. And this is exactly where Paul would have stood. Mars Hill back in the day uh, used to be the place where people would rule from, govern from. Just an interesting fact about uh, Athens, it was the place where it said democracy was born. 500 years before Christ, when kings were ruling the earth, empires were coming and going, uh, the Athenians elected their own governing body from its citizens to rule over them. Now, there were a bunch of rich monarchs, but they were still elected by the citizens, and they would rule, and they would govern, and they would counsel from right here on Mars Hill. At the time of Paul, it's become a place where the thinkers of the day come, and they discuss these philosophies, and they reason with one another. It was said that there were about 30 influencers, if you will. See, students, there weren't just so influencers today on social media. They were back then, all right? This is like the, the, the philosophy police, if you will. And they would listen to your argument, listen to your debate, listen to your worldview, and they would determine whether or not to give credence to it or if it was a threat to the state, they could run you out of town. This is where Paul goes right here. And this is where he speaks of Jesus. And the philosophers are there, and they give Paul the floor. And so look at verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus. Now imagine this scene. Paul's there. Uh, this is another shot of Mars Hill with the Parthenon where is in the background here. This is where he would have been standing right down here. Looking back over here, here's a rendering of it. This was on the northwest side. This would have been the south side. Mars Hill would have been on the other side. But you kind of get the picture of what it would have been looking like as Paul began his sermon right here in Acts 17. And look at what he says here. Men of Athens, I perceive in every way that you are very religious. And he had a great object lesson right there with his background. You are very religious, uber religious. Now keep in mind, Paul's a lawyer. He's brilliant, trained in Tarsus. <clears throat> he knows what he believes. He knows why he believes it. Remember what we said last week? Man, we ought to know the scriptures like Paul. We ought to examine it like the Bereans so we can debate it with the Athenians, all right? And Paul, he knows what he believes. Now, here's what I want to do. I'm going to read his sermon in full, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Starting in the second part of verse 22, men of Athens, I perceive that you are in every way very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Pretty, pretty brilliant right there. They were admitting the fact that they didn't, there was maybe a God out there that they didn't know. And Paul says, I'll tell you who this unknown God is. He begins to tell them it's the creator of the universe. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he's needed anything. Can't you see him pointing to the part of the line? It's not God, the creator of heaven and earth, he needs a temple to live in? Created by human hands? No. He gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Verse 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of the dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps fill their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Paul's saying, listen, you think God is detached, that he's distant, that he doesn't care. I'm telling you, God is more near than you can ever imagine. You're straining for him. And then he uses some of their own poets to kind of extract truth and apply it to the greater truth of Jesus. He says uh, in verse uh, 28, for in him 
We live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring, bringing in God's offspring. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art or imagination of man. If we're God's offspring and we can live and breathe and feel and have passions and think and reflect, you think a God that created you as his offspring is gonna be a little image? Paul's using brilliant rhetorical skills. It doesn't make sense. So he says, the time of ignorance, verse 30, God is overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And of this, he has given us his assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, a slow reading of this, even what I just did, taking it out and doing some commentary, took about three and a half minutes. Um, so most believe this wasn't all of Paul's sermon that day. It was just a small excerpt of the sermon. And commentaries, I'm telling you, you could study this and it's worthy to be studied, are filled with this sermon and how Paul preached the sermon and outlining the sermon. And they go in detail, I mean, line after line, page after page of explaining Paul's sermon. And it's, and it's worth that. But for time's sake, we can't do it. So what I want to do is not get so granular with you. I just want to kind of go big picture First of all, it is a great passage on substance. Um, if you look at this, if I was to just encapsulate it, uh, Paul says there's a creator. You could take this outline and tell anybody about Jesus. There's a creator. He wants to be known. You can know him. And there's a judgment coming. I mean, you could build any conversation off of that right there with someone about Jesus Christ. There's a creator. Uh, he wants to be known. So he left heaven and came to earth in the person of Jesus. He died, he's buried, he's raised again, he's coming again, there's a judgment coming. You could tell somebody about Jesus just right there. If I was to encapsulate this and just kind of give you a Cliff Notes version of this sermon, that's kind of what Paul did. Based on substance, it's a great sermon. Philosophically, he answers all of the deep questions of life. Any, 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 uh, anybody that uh, uh, thinks about life wants an answer to these four questions. You'll see them on the screen. Who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? That's a deep question of life. All of us are trying to figure out those questions. Paul, in this sermon, answers all of them. Who am I? We're created in the image of God. Where did I come from? The, the loving creator, God. Why am I here? To know him. God wants to be known. That's why he made himself known in the person of Jesus. Where am I going? There's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a judgment. We're going to be held accountable for our life. Paul covers all of these philosophical questions in this message right here. We could look at it from a substance standpoint. It's great. We could look at it from a philosophical standpoint. It answers all the questions. We could look at it from a stylistic standpoint. I mean, notice what Paul did. When he starts this message off, he says, men of Athens, I perceive you are very religious. He didn't say, men of Athens, turn or burn, baby. <laughs> he didn't do that. He didn't pick at them or start ranting them, ranting on them or yelling at them. No, he, he leaned in. He, 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 hey, I perceive you're very religious. You're, you're trying it here. He was creative. I mean, he had the object lesson of the, the altar. He'd done his homework, man. He went around the city, unknown God. Man, I can, I can point people to Jesus from that. Uses their own literature to point to the truth of Christ. He challenges them. I mean, stylistically, it's beautiful. Yes, he cares about them. You get this genuine heart for people, but he doesn't sacrifice truth. I mean, you look at that sermon. I mean, he says, it's time to repent. There's coming an appointed time. God was going to judge you. So, I mean, stylistically, from a substance and philosophy, it's a great sermon. But here's what I want to do. Let's not get in the weeds. Let's pull back out. And let me just very quickly, as we bring this sermon to a close, give you four things we learn from this message here in Acts 17 and really all of Paul's um, uh, time here in Athens. Four truths, four encouragements, four challenges, however you want to look at it. And number one is this. Be faithful to preach Jesus and the resurrection. This is our job. This is what we learned from Paul. You, you put his sermon in a sentence, he preached Jesus and the resurrection. Don't worry about style. You know, you can be smooth as silk, but if you don't preach Jesus and the resurrection, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about substance. Sometimes we talk about sharing Jesus. We give you outlines to memorize and passages to memorize and we start fumbling and we get all nervous about memorizing things. Preach Jesus and the resurrection. That makes an effective witness. When Paul goes to Corinth, we're gonna look at that in two weeks. When Paul goes to Corinth, 
Um, he would tell them later when he writes his letter to Corinth. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The Bible says this. When I came to you, brothers, you think Paul focused on substance and style? His sermon had them both, but that wasn't his focus. He said, when I came to you, brothers, did not... Uh, I didn't come proclaiming to you uh, the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He says, listen, I'm preaching the resurrection. It doesn't matter how it comes across, the content's what's important. That Jesus is the son of God, that he gave his life on a cross for us. He died as a sacrifice for our sins and he was resurrected to life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I deliver to you what is first importance, that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised again according to the scriptures. It's the resurrection that Paul saw as the linchpin of history. It was changing everything. It was the hope of history. He says later in 1 Corinthians 15, if the resurrection doesn't happen, then our faith is futile and we above all people are hopeless and helpless. To him, the resurrection was everything. And so it was this message that he preached, whether it was going to the synagogues, speaking to religious Jews or the marketplace, speaking to the common working person or whether it was on Mars Hill, speaking to the best and the brightest, the message never changed. It was Jesus and the resurrection. May we be faithful to always preach Jesus and the resurrection. That's what it's about. That's why we're here. Preach Jesus in the resurrection. Number two, I'm moving. Foster a soft heart toward people. Foster a soft heart toward people. Man, Paul, look at his life. Man, if anybody could have been jaded, suspicious of people, it was Paul. Beaten, thrown in jail, ran out of town. And it seems that Paul just had a soft heart toward people. He saw the idolatry and the wickedness. And the being led astray and the spiritual blindness, it broke his heart. I have a mentor in my life that told me one time, Jarrett, never let anyone out of your circle of love. Meaning if somebody offends you, hurts you, abuses you, sins against you, don't let them out of your circle of love. Now that doesn't mean they're in your top five call list, okay? And it doesn't mean that you're going to be a close friend to them. But what he was teaching there is don't let your heart get hard over people like that because if your heart can get hard over people like that your heart will grow hard toward other people keep a soft pliable heart Paul's heart he sees this wickedness inside and it breaks his heart because these are people that are going to die in their sins they're going to die not knowing that Jesus came to save them he broke his heart this old song we used to sing break our hearts oh God For the sin in our lives, break our hearts. For the sin in our land, break our hearts. Paul's heart was always soft, it seems. Make this your prayer today. God, make my heart soft toward that coworker that doesn't know you. That friend I go to school with that doesn't have a personal relationship with you. That neighbor that I have. God, give me a soft heart toward them. And begin praying that God would open up a door so that like Paul, You could preach Jesus and the resurrection to them. Listen, Easter is seven weeks away. It's seven weeks away. I mean, that's that's the Super Bowl, the World Series, the NBA Championship, all combined in one for the Christian, okay? Begin praying right now. You all know someone that doesn't know Jesus. God, make my heart soft toward them. And give me a... Open the door for me to invite them to church. Because I can promise you this. You get them there, I'm going to preach. If... If I have breath in my lungs and I'm standing, I will preach Jesus and the resurrection. Get them here. You never know. An invitation could change someone's life. Number three, take confidence in a reasoned faith. Take confidence in a reasoned faith. Listen, when Paul was so eager to speak at Athens because he knew that his faith was a reasonable faith. He knew when you came to church, you didn't have to check your mind at the door. I mean, he he knew what he believed. He could go to Mars Hill in confidence because his faith, once delivered for the saints could stand against any worldly ideology or philosophy out there. Epicureans and Stoics, they took pride in their ability to reason and use logic. Paul said, bring it on. 
I got something logical and reasonable for you. Now, unspiritual people, as the Bible calls them, people who don't know Jesus, they're spiritually blinded, their heart's hard, they can't see spiritual things, they're never gonna understand the resurrection and the power of the resurrection. I mean, a dead man, dead people don't rise up. But Jesus did. And Paul, he knew he had a reason, logical faith. And, you know, just to give you this, this, this is just a freebie here, okay? I'll go through it really quickly. We had Lee Strobel. Uh, here speaking to our staff last year and he gave the case for Easter and he just did it in uh, this word feet, F-E-A-T alright, I'll just give them to you F, this is the case for the resurrection F, fatal torment in the other words, he's, he says this is a reasonable faith the resurrection, I mean when someone died a Roman crucifixion they knew they were dead I mean you didn't survive a Roman crucifixion E, empty tomb now, it's, it's told today that somebody stole the body. You know, that rumor's going around to this day, the Bible says. But, at, but nobody's arguing. That tomb's empty. There ain't no bones there. There's no body there. A, appearances. The Bible says there, that Jesus appeared to over 500 people. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, most of those people are still alive. Go talk to them. Interview them. They saw Jesus. We touched him. We ate with him. T is transformation. All of the disciples' lives transformed, changed uh, because of the gospel. We have a logical faith. Uh, We have a reasonable faith. And so take confidence. Wherever you're talking, whoever you're talking to, you don't have to back down. You stand firm because our faith is a reasonable faith. In a world full of agnostics and atheists, we don't have to back down or hold back what we believe. Instead, we can stand up and stand firm because we have truth on our side. Speaking of atheism, next week, speaking of atheism, don't miss next week. In fact, if you have friends that are atheists or agnostic, don't believe uh, our own Mark Lanier, who teaches the Bible, biblical literacy class down in the FLC, he's going to be here. He's released his new book called Atheism on Trial. For those of you who don't know Mark, he's uh, one of the world's uh, foremost trial attorneys in the world. And he's written this book, Atheism on Trial, and he tries it from the standpoint of attorney. And Mark's done it, and he has found that atheism is lacking. And so he's going to tell us about that next week. You'll want to be here. And we planned it specifically to come right after this message on Mars Hill where people were believing in all kinds of gods. Next week's going to be strictly for people who don't believe in any god. It's going to be a great resource for us as we're talking with friends. Number four, and I'll close with this, is leave witnessing results to God. You see how this text ended? Verse 32, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Some people, this is what happens every week. The gospel's share. Some people reject it, mock it, don't believe it. Other people say, I'm going to leave and think about that a little bit more. And then other people believe it, embrace it, and their life is changed forever. You know, some people think, that Paul was a failure here in Athens because there was not a church planted there. Um, He goes to Corinth and God gives him a vision, says, I got many people in this city and many think that maybe God gave him that vision because he was discouraged and depressed about his time in Athens, again, thinking he was a failure, but I don't think that's the case at all. Paul went to Athens to speak about Jesus and he did it. And some people received him, Christ, and some people rejected Christ. But what makes you a faithful witness is not the results. What makes you a faithful witness is did you preach Jesus in the resurrection? If nobody would have believed in Athens, Paul would have been a success. Listen, I'm going to give an invitation here in one minute. A public invitation where we ask people who need to receive Christ to come forward. People who join the church to come forward. People who need prayer to come forward. You say, Pastor Jared, you get disappointed when no one comes forward? Not at all. Not going to affect my nap I take this afternoon? Not one bit. (laughs) Now, do I want to see it? Certainly. I want to see Billy Graham crusade every Sunday. Come forward. Receive Christ. Encourage you to come. But the results aren't up to me. My job is to preach Jesus in the resurrection. And God will do what he wants to do. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. 
At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God, to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforest.org slash connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus in person on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.